So this, this whole story feels like a nothing story in the sense that the conclusions that highly paid multimillionaire Hollywood executives, the, the conclusion that they have reached is so common sense that it makes me want to like slap them. <laughs> because they're they're trotting out these conclusions like they've stumbled upon the holy grail of business strategy. So Disney's Bob Iger, CEO, pictured here, right, has announced that Marvel's uh, Marvel Studios output in terms of like the MCU, whether it be films or television pro uh, productions like on Disney Plus, that Marvel's output output will decrease substantially going forward. So. For 2024, for this year, um, the only Marvel film releasing is going to be Deadpool and Wolverine, that third Deadpool film. That's going to be releasing in July. Um, there's still four films planned for 2025, but that's kind of like a vestige of their previous release strategy. So we're going to have Captain America Brave New World, which is essentially Falcon and the Winter Soldier, the movie. Um, that's going to be coming out in February of 2025. And then Thunderbolts in May, the Fantastic Four in July, and then if it ends up actually getting made, Blade in November, which is great timing. Though I maybe would have put it in October, but, you know, they, 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 I would say they know what they're doing, but recent events have shown that maybe they, maybe they don't. Um, but then going forward, the idea is to really pull back on the output. So we have this a quote here from Iger saying, quote, I've been working hard with the studio to reduce output and focus more on quality. That's particularly true with Marvel movies and television shows. Some of what is coming up is a vestige of basically a desire in the past to increase volume. We're slowly going to decrease volume and go to probably about two TV series a year instead of what had become four and reduce our film output from maybe four a year to two uh, to the maximum three, end quote. So essentially what Bob Iger is saying is, you know, we realized maybe if we focus on quality over quantity, they, these films will be will both be better and do better financially. Duh! Like it's 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 just insane that these people get paid millions and millions and millions of dollars. You know, and uh, you know, this is not the first time Bob Iger has said this. I think he alluded to this a couple months ago. I was going to do a story about it, but it just ended up being a busier week and. And uh, there was more interesting stuff to talk about. But, you know, everyone was just, like, roasting Disney and Bob Iger on, on social media. And um, I think I saw, like, a funny tweet where it was, like, you know, disgruntled Disney executives sitting in a boardroom. They've been, they've been there for days. They don't know what to do. And then someone gets up without saying anything and, you know, opens up the marker and writes, make good movies and everyone goes what so you know so here's like the context for for all of this so you know marvel's output specifically when it comes to like disney marvel studios like the mcu has stead has slowly but surely kind of grown over you know basically grew over the it's it's you know first decade so you look at phase one of the mcu it was basically like one film a year sometimes two um, but typically just one film a year. And then uh, phase two, it eventually grew to two films a year. Um, and then by the end of phase three, we were getting up to three films a year. So like in that last year of 2019, when Endgame came out, we had had Captain Marvel in the early part of the year, then Endgame, of course, and then in the summer, uh, Spider-Man Far From Home, right? So this, this uh, output basically um, amounts to roughly two films a year, 23 films over an 11 year period. Um, and this, of course, as we all know, was a huge cash cow for, for Marvel and Disney. Um, and, and, and it seemed like the MCU was designed to be a cash cow um, in the sense that, you know, you were able to get to that point where you could release three a year and they were all mammothly successful. Right, um, I think in 2019 Disney had seven films cross a billion dollars. Two of those were Marvel. One of those being Endgame, almost got three billion dollars. And technically, they had another film cross a billion, Spider-Man: Far From Home, but they shared that with Sony, of course. But again, that's another film that was so successful. And the reason why this worked is because, in general. In terms of like the content, theoretically, though some people have complained, me being one of them, that this is not quite true, but the films were different enough to not feel oversaturated yet, right? Because obviously that became an issue later. 
So they were different enough not to feel oversaturated, yet due to the narrative connections, people wanted to see everything. They wanted to make sure that they saw this film, even if it doesn't seem like it's super important, because then it might get referenced later and at the very least, it'll be like a fun Easter egg that kind of rewards you for having seen them all. Or it could even be as important as like, this character is now super important to this film and they were introduced over here, right? Um, so it seemed like a, a money printing machine, right? Following Endgame, this is where I think Disney and Marvel, but I think specifically Disney, got greedy, right? Um, and they really wanted that gravy train to continue. So, you know, this is all tied into... So, you have all the films, right? And a lot of this got, sh you know, shooken up, shook up um, due to the pandemic. Like, um, the first post-Endgame film, I guess besides Spider-Man no, Far From Home, but that was almost like felt like an epilogue to Endgame. The first Phase 4 MCU film, Black Widow, was going to come out like May of 2020. And then, of course, the pandemic thwarted everything, right? Um... So that was like a forced pause, but the the plan was to still release like three films in 2020 or, or however many it was going to be, eventually maybe getting up to like four films, right? So that's its own thing, which could start to get grading because it's more films a year than we have ever had before. And we just finished off the saga and a lot of people wanted Marvel and Disney to take a break and to take a pause and let people miss the MCU. Right? So all of what I just described would already be a problem. But at the same time, in late 2019, Disney launches Disney Plus, right? In their big effort to beat Netflix at their own game, which everyone in retrospect has decided that all of these studio owned streaming services was a huge mistake. Um, it's starting to get uh, better, but it's just, it's had a lot of, it, it's, it's becoming successful in spite of itself, right? But, what do you need on a streaming service like Netflix? You need content, right? And Disney especially does not have the library that some of these other studios have because for most of their history, they were very specialized, you know, um, focusing on the animated films, right? As like the core um, kind of core asset that the company has. That's obviously expanded. And it was even expanding back in like the 40s and 50s with like more live action content. Um, but that's obviously way different now. But even when you include like Marvel and Star Wars and Lucasfilm and now 20th Century Fox, which is the primary reason why they bought 20th Century Fox was to have that content, it still needs to make as much content as possible, especially original content. So, you know, Disney Plus really became, you know, it really seemed like Disney was leaning on Marvel and Marvel Studios and Kevin Feige to supply a huge percentage of this original content. So in 2021... And again, this is maybe a little bit unfair because some of this probably would have come out in 2020 and it kind of got all smushed in 2021. But 2021 saw five new Marvel shows on Disney+. Plus: WandaVision, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Loki, Hawkeye, and if you also want to include it, uh, the animated What If series. So that is just... Is it, even if you count the shows as a movie, and really we should count them as like two or three movies because they're so long... But let's just count them as one. Five shows, four movies, 20, that's like nine different things. So naturally fatigues set in, right? And again, this was natural after Endgame. And I don't necessarily know if the quality of this content got necessarily got, got worse. But people got tired of it, right? It felt like it was getting worse. I would argue that... The highs were just as high and the lows were just as low, but because people were, it was, they were getting so much of it. It's not that there was oversaturation, but more so when you see nine things versus like two or three things of the year, the flaws that are common throughout all of them really jump out, right? Because you're, 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 you're getting inundated with it all of the time, right? And this really culminated in this past year in 2023 with Quantumadia, um, not doing awful, but that was meant to be almost like an Avengers level event introducing Kang, which of course is like a whole other piece of drama, right? Um, but then the Marvels in the uh, fall of last year that just completely just just tanked at the box office and also just wasn't super well received, right? So this this public this decision 
to publicly say, like, we're going to reduce the output feels like an admission of failure, um, at least in terms of the strategy, right? So to be fair, Bob Iger, um, you know, had left the company like right before COVID um, and has now come back because as he was like, please, Bob Iger, help us. You are our only hope. But he, admittedly, even though he was gone when all this when all this really went downhill, you know, he's the one who created the conditions for this. Again, it was his mandate, more or less, that, you know, to, to create all this content so they could try to be competitive in the streaming wars, right? Um, it's so, so ultimately, this decision hurt the brand. So Marvel across, you know, beyond just the Disney Plus shows, Marvel has just, as a brand, has just been severely weakened. Um, and they didn't beat Netflix, right? And they're not, they're nowhere even close to reaching Netflix's uh, subscriber numbers. Uh, we have a quote here from um, Luis Despacito, who's the co-president of Marvel Studios, saying, quote, if we just stayed on top, that would have been the worst thing that could have happened to us. We took a little hit. We're coming back strong. Maybe when you do too much, you dilute yourself a little bit. We're not going to do that anymore. We learned our lesson. Maybe two to three films a year and one or two shows as opposed to doing four films and four shows, end quote. Again, great point. Did Did you need to go through the past five years to arrive to that conclusion? I could have told you that in your board meetings in 2019 when you were deciding to do all this stuff. Um, you know, and there's something to this idea of diluting, right? Because ultimately, whether you thought the MCU was great or awful or somewhere in the middle, whatever you thought, having more content, it does, it does mean that everyone, particularly Kevin Feige, who is like the main overseer of everything, is spread way more thin, right? Um... And again, I, I kind of like this quote because it's kind of like, you know, it's actually a good thing that we failed so spectacularly. I'm like, yeah, but like you're really, you are really trying to make lemonade out of out of some self, self-inflicted self lemons here. Um, also just, this is like a sidebar, but like where's Feige in all of this? Like we've been hearing people say stuff like this, like, um, like um, Bob Iger for like months now, but where's Kevin Feige? Cause I feel like he used to always be front and center when it came to talking about like the trajectory and the business strategies of the MCU. Um, we do have a quote from him here though. Um, saying quote, it's nice to be able to rally behind one feature project this year. I'm much more comfortable being the underdog. I prefer being able to surprise and exceed expectations. So it does seem like the last year, which has not been ideal, has set us up well for that end quote. And that he's referencing there how the creation of the MCU was very much an underdog project. Cause essentially, you know, not to get too much into history, but by, um, by the, uh, what was it? Like the nineties, Disney, had, uh, not Disney, Marvel had basically sold off the movie rights to a bunch of its most popular characters in order to avoid, you know, to, to kind of get some influx of Marvel comics was not doing particularly well financially. So that's why you kind of saw them all spread out at different studios. So you had Spider-Man over at Sony and you had Hulk at Universal and you had the X-Men and Fantastic Four with Fox. And, and it was all spread out like that. Well, by the mid-2000s, seeing the success of the X-Men films and Spider-Man, um, Marvel decided, well, why don't, we, why don't we make our own films with the characters we still have the movie rights to? So who was that? All of, like, the B-list characters. So Iron Man is considered one of the premier Marvel characters now. 20 years ago, he was not particularly well-known to the general population. To comic book fans, he was super important. But most people, he was not up there with Spider-Man and Wolverine and uh, Hulk and, and characters like that. Um, so when they made the first Iron Man, it was really a big bet. You know, they basically didn't have a shooting script. They were basically improv it on set. We had Robert Downey Jr. cast, who was basically a washed up alcoholic actor who, you know, basically had hit rock bottom. You have John Favreau directing, who was primarily known for directing comedies like uh, was it Swingers and Elf? Um, so, so I could see where Kevin Feige is coming from, where it was like there was there's something, there is something to being the underdog and being able to exceed expectations. Whereas when you are the top dog, even the most mild of disappointments or failures really stick out, right? And again, but but again, this whole thing over like quality over quantity again, it just feels like an obvious like there's a reason why that phrase exists. No one has ever said quantity over quality. So I don't know why you thought that would work. Um, again, and, and kind of reiterating what I've said, I, I disagree somewhat with the premise of superhero fatigue. This idea that like, oh, these movies aren't doing well because there's just so many of them and audiences are getting bored. If people, people will watch, excuse me, people will watch them if they're good 
or they're novel, or they're interesting, or they do something new with the genre. That, that'd be like saying, oh, they make so many movies. It's like, yeah, because there could be, you could make 500 great movies. You know what I mean? By all different kinds of movies and all different styles and different tastes. And and, and it just feels, the, the idea of like there just being too much of superhero films, I think just shows an like incredible lack of imagination. Um, so, so to tie all this up, so what's the future of the MCU? Um, this goes without saying, it's not just about reducing the output. The films that they do put out need to take more risks, right? Creative risks. Um, cause if you look at what have been the most successful, um, superhero films, and I don't just mean in terms of box office, but in terms of the cultural impact, Sam Raimi Spider-Man films, Particularly the first two. The th third one was a misstep, but I, I quite like it. But I also grew up with it, right? So, but the Sam Raimi Spider-Man films. Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight films. Uh, MCU films like Iron Man. And to an extent, The Avengers. And uh, if you want to look at something more modern, uh, DC's Joker, right? Something completely different. That I think is a kind of mediocre movie, but it also made over a billion dollars off of a pretty small budget compared to, compared to some other superhero films or comic book based films, right? And so what do all those have in common? If it, it was a director's vision, you can debate if the vision was good or if the films were good, but it was a director's vision. Um, so I think that is going to be essential for striking lightning in a bottle again, right? Another thing that the MCU needs to do, it needs to focus more on characters and their arcs right and focusing on characters doesn't mean giving characters cool moments to do cool stuff i'm talking about you know classic story and narrative and actual opportunities for characters with flaws and goals to have opportunities for change and again all those examples i just listed have all that right um you know because eventually these mcu movies stopped being about even like mediocrely basic character growth. And I even like throw away like throwaway character arcs. Like these films really stopped being about anything um, remotely interesting. Um, and in addition to, um, like I was saying before about taking risks, showing us something creatively new, um, but also just literally showing us something new, right? So, you know, we're finally going to get the Fantastic Four and eventually the X-Men into the MCU, right? We've never seen those interpretations, right? And some would argue we've never had a good Fantastic Four film. Um, so if they can stick the landing on those two properties, it could save the MCU. Um, but I'm almost of the mind, I don't know if I want to see the MCU get saved. And it probably just needs a clean reboot. Just a clean wipe, do some final huge crossover multiverse event that kind of just kind of like what they did in the comics where it was just a nice clean reset um and that would be really interesting to see because unlike in the mid 2000s marvel now has all the toys in the toy box they have all of those characters they don't have to try to build a team out of b-list characters they can they can have and they can make from from the jump spider-man work with hulk who's working with Wolverine, like you can do them all however you want to do it. Um, that's kind of where I'm at. Um, and that's what I would like to see, but you know, only time will tell. We have a comment here. Where's Kevin, presumably Feige, where's Kevin fit into this? How does he feel about the downscaling? Again, that may have been before I was talking about Kevin, but again, we don't really know. And that's a really good question. We don't really know how he feels. The impression I've always gotten is this mandate for more content, more content, more content, was imposed on him um, inherently, but that's not to say that he resented it or or disagreed with it. Because again, he's a nerd, a Marvel nerd first and foremost. And I say that uh, completely um, with love. I don't say that as like a, a pejorative. So I would not be surprised if this was a mandate, which he was like, okay, great. If you're gonna give me the money to make all this stuff, that's that's great because I want to do all these kinds of stories, right? And tackle all these um, characters and different material. Again, it's just, I think he slowly realized that um, he just couldn't sustain. Again, he's just spread way too thin. He just can't kind of have that quality control 
that um, you know you'd be able to have when it's uh, less films or just less projects. Because again, the the shows are basically just like long films. So you know, having eight projects, whether they're shows or movies, come out in a year, that's a lot. Even for Kevin Feige, you know the the you know Hollywood's wonder boy in terms of a franchise producing. That's just, that, that might be a little bit out of reach. 